All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Scott Newbold. I'm a member of the biology faculty at Sheridan College uh, and help coordinate the um, Sheridan College Museum of Discovery Science lecture series uh, that we're fortunate to have uh, sponsorship and support from the Sheridan College Foundation and the Life Science Department at the college, both of which support the lectures and the other activities that we have um, through the museum. Just one note before I introduce tonight's speaker that um, along the way, as questions occur to you, please submit those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and then uh, we can look at and address those at the end of the talk. That would be great. So it's my distinct pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce tonight's speaker, Matthew Craig, a biology faculty member from Gillette College and a close colleague and an integral member of our department. Uh, Matthew completed a bachelor's degree in wildlife biology and a master's degree with an emphasis in herpetology at Western uh, at West Texas A&M University. His master's work utilized radio telemetry in an ecological and behavioral study of the Kegel's map turtle, a species endemic to the Guadalupe River in South Texas. Matthew went on to take additional graduate courses at the University of Oklahoma, where he did research on community ecology of stream fishes with an emphasis on uh, in multi-species shoaling behavior. Matthew has been teaching for 34 years at the college level. He and his family moved to Wyoming six years ago, and he teaches biology and microbiology at uh, Gillette College. I consider myself very fortunate to have Matt as a colleague. We've done a lot of projects together over the years. He's an outstanding educator, cares deeply about his students uh, and their achievements and their ability to succeed in, in their pursuits. So um, thrilled to have him tonight uh, sharing insights about CRISPR and the future of gene editing technology. Thanks, Matt, for being here tonight with us. Thank you, Scott. And I want to especially thank you for inviting me and thank thank those who are who are joined in. Um, just it's real pleasure. And uh, I'm honored to be here. So thank you very much. And I will also mention how what a pleasure it is to work with with Dr. Newbold. He's he's been a, um, a colleague, a mentor, uh, 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 just has helped a tremendous amount. And I thank you. So I appreciate the, the interactions, too. So. All right. Well, let me get started on this. Let me see how I go back to um, sharing my screen and get this thing going. So, all right. So we are going to talk about CRISPR tonight. CRISPR is a an incredible uh, genetic tool for editing and and modifying uh, genes. It is a very recent technology, um, and it is taking taking the world really by storm. Um, so let's take a, a look. So. What does CRISPR stand for? It's an, an acronym for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats. Um, more on that here shortly, but that's that's what it stands for. And the CAS9, so when you hear CAS related to CRISPR technologies, um, CRISPR, CAS will be from CRISPR-associated genes. There's also genes that are associated, that make the proteins needed for this to happen. And those we call CAS genes for CRISPR associated. So let's take a little bit of look at the sort of the initial discovery, a little bit on the history, just a very brief amount of history on this. And as far back as 1987, uh, Yushizumi uh, Yushizu, uh, Ishino at the at uh, Osaka University in Japan, he and his team were the first to to describe CRISPR. Um, they didn't call it. CRISPR, but what they they described these interspersed repeats, and so what they found was they were they were looking at E. coli, looking at E. coli, Escherichia coli, the bacteria, and they noticed that there were these series of repeats that were spaced by non-repeated DNA. So that was unusual, and the function was unknown. So here here's my crude representation of DNA. And we see frequently where there will be repeats in the DNA. So this DNA is identical to this, to this, to this, to this. So it's not a, it's very common for there to be repeated sequences of DNA within chromosomes, both bacterial and, and eukaryotic chromosomes. However, this was different because what it was, it was these repeats. So this piece, this piece, this piece, these dark blue pieces are identical. Those are the repeats. 
And these are the spacer DNA segments that are unique. So this sequence is different than this one, which is different than all the others. So, so I've indicated here with, you know, again, very simple um, so sort of PowerPoint um, image that you have this series of um, clustered, interspersed, you know, regularly interspersed um, segments of DNA. Later research would show that there were other genes associated with this DNA. We call those the CRISPR-associated genes. So anytime there was this CRISPR uh, sequence, there would also be CRISPR-associated genes. The purpose of this, of this genome was unknown until fairly recently. In 2012, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel uh, Charpentier, uh, she's French, Jennifer Doudna is American, they collaborated, they and their labs collaborated um, and identified the function of the CRISPR-Cas9 system for which they won the Nobel Prize in chemistry last year. Very, uh, they're all over, for example, the internet right now, it's, a, it's incredibly, um, incredibly well received. And what they were able to discover and identify is the function, it effectively functions as a bacterial immune response. So think about bacteria, single cell, um, you as a large multicellular organism, you have a lot of cells devoted in your immune response, devoted to producing antibodies that will attack uh, antigens and then other cells like your, your, your T cells and your macrophages, et cetera, others that will specifically target um, invading cells or invading viruses or you know whatever the like might be. They don't, they can't, they are a cell, so they can't have cells devoted to that. But it turns out they have this mechanism, this CRISPR mechanism. There are some others you may be aware of, like restriction enzymes or another bacterial mechanism to act as a as an immune response. But what ends up happening is when a bacteriophage, a bacteriophage is a virus which infects bacteria. And they're just amazing. They, they look like something out of Star Wars or, you know, they just have this uh, amazing capsid. Um, but they will include uh, DNA or RNA, usually DNA. And so they will attach to the bacterium. They will insert their genetic material into the bacterium. And if successful, this, this genetic material will um, hijack the, the machinery of the bacteria, just like it does in your cells, to make more viral nucleic acid and to make the protein capsomeres that will make the, make the protein coat. But if the bacteria can defeat this virus before it overtakes the bacteria, a lot of these have a mechanism. What they'll do is they'll take a unique piece of this viral DNA and they'll incorporate it into the bacterial chromosome. And that's what I've tried to basically indicate here. So here's this viral DNA segment that's unique to this virus and unique from, it's not, it's a sequence that's not found elsewhere in the bacterium and it will incorporate it into that DNA. Now let's take it to the next step. So here, what now you'll see that sort of that segment of DNA that I made earlier. So anytime in the evolutionary history of this organism that it defeats a virus, it will take a piece of that virus and insert it. So I used red on this last one. Well, here are the, here are those regular, repeats, but then here's the interspersed part. It turns out this interspersed part, this spacer unique DNA is remnants of viruses. So these are remnants of other viruses that this bacterium has defeated in the, in the ancestral past. And then of course, here are cast genes. This allows it to have a library of potential um, viral pathogens that could infect it. Now, pathogens, viruses still kill an awful lot of bacteria, but this is a mechanism for this, for this bacterium to, to help fight off and ward off potential viral attacks. So it's a, bio, it's a bacterial immune response. Um, and that's what Doudna and, uh, and uh, uh, Chapintier were able to identify that it was, it, it, this is how it functioned. Let me get that. Now, before I move on, I want to mention just a little about some DNA replication and transcription just sort of bring everyone up to snuff because it can be important to understand how it works. So remember with DNA, uh, DNA has four uh, nucleotide nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Uh, we, we tend to abbreviate it down to A's, T's, C's, and G's. 
Adenine always binds to thymine, thymine to adenine, cytosine to guanine, guanine to cytosine. So, so I've just started it here. So if this is an adenine, an A will bring in a T, a T will bring in an A, a C will bring in a G, and a G will bring in uh, a C. And so if you have one side, you have the other side. And that's, you know, most people understand that. Um, here, I've just continued on the sequence. And of course, the complement will form. And this would be our, our double-stranded DNA. Of course, it's usually in a helix. I've straightened it out here for ease of looking at it. So let's continue on with DNA replication. Um, DNA replication occurs when the, the machinery, there's a lot of enzymes that do this, helicase and DNA polymerase and RNA primase and a whole lot of enzymes involved here. But what will happen is the DNA will be split in half um, in pieces. It's not the whole thing like this, but again, the limitations of PowerPoint. And then it will bring in the machinery to make a copy and so what it'll do is it will start, um, you don't see the machinery here, but basically it will bring in the complementary nucleotide to make a, to, to finish out that strand simultaneously, it'll be bringing in the nucleotides for the other strand. When it's all said and done, you have two identical replicates. This is for the purpose of cell division. DNA replication is for the purpose of cell division, whether it be bacterial or eukaryotic or archaean, it always replicates so that the cell can 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 divide. That's the main main function of it. So DNA is read through a process called transcription to make RNA. So let's just here's that same DNA split open strand. It'll be different enzymes, but basically RNA is created the same way. A single strand of RNA is created on the template strand of the DNA to make the RNA. Um, Many students will be aware of messenger RNA, but we now have lots of different kinds of RNA, uh, which, which, for example, this discussion tonight is about a different kind of RNA called guide RNA. The RNA will, as it's being made, will come off of the DNA strand. The DNA will close back up if it's, you know, basically it's a small little segment that's being read at any one time. And now that RNA uh, can be used for whatever the purpose might be. Typically, very commonly, it's translation. So the process of translation is where um, in a eukaryotic cell, the messenger RNA that was just created through this process that we just looked at, um, goes out into the, into the um, cytoplasm of the cell. A ribosome will attach at the, at, the, at the upstream end. It will read it. It will produce a protein based on the sequence of nucleotides. It will bring in the appropriate amino acids in a very specific sequence. Um, those, those sequences are categorized into what we call codons. And so the codon, one codon codes for one amino acid, the next codon for another amino acid, et cetera. And through this process, a very specific identical protein. The protein can, produce, can be produced over and over and over that is identical, no changes to it. And so that's the process of translation. So translation is making protein off of RNA and trans, uh, uh, transcription is the process of making RNA off of DNA. Now, um, a little definition, genes. Genes are sequences of DNA which code for specific sequences of amino acids, therefore specific proteins. And as long as that sequence is correct, you've got a functional protein. But when that sequence gets garbled in some way, you can have dysfunctional or missing, missing proteins. So let's continue. Let's go back at this at this space. So now I'm going, I'm concentrating back at these repeats that are in the bacterial genome. And this is the DNA. This represents the DNA from one of these repeats. And so this DNA is the same here, is the same here, is the same here, same here, same here, along. So what is happening? So this is the interspaced DNA and it's palindromic. Palindromic, you know, race car is an example of a word. You read it both directions, it says race car, dad, that's a simple version, right? DAD, read it backwards, it's DAD. Well, these are palindromes as well. So for example, this and this, if you read it this way, you read it that way, it's the same thing. This and this are the same thing. They're palindromic. Um, what that has an advantage, what that does is as this is replicated, so it gets replicated, um, splits open, this RNA is produced. This is not going to be messenger RNA. Instead, this is going to be guide RNA. It come, obviously comes off the DNA then. And 
what this does is because these are palindromes, so this CAA and this, this, this GUUU, et cetera, will actually form together to make a hairpin. And then out here will be this, this spacer DNA. I don't have it continued out here, but in a minute we will. But this piece would go on here, or this piece would go on here. This is always the same, but the, but the unique DNA can be changed out right here. All right, so the Cas proteins are going to be able to recognize that DNA, I'm sorry, that RNA complex. Um, Cas proteins are typically helicases and nucleases. Um, helicases unzip DNA and nucleases cut DNA. So if we look at those that are specific to bacterial uh, systems, they, they basically, it's a, it'll, it can open up the DNA, it can read the DNA, and at a certain point it can cut the DNA. And then in addition, you have the guide RNA. So let's take a look at a little picture to kind of uh, put that in place. So the Cas genes will code for the Cas protein. In this case, Cas9, there are, other, there are other Cas proteins, but in this case, Cas9. Now this is a very simple rudimentary you know, image to depict it. This is a, a, a 3D, you know, a, a more properly rendered image, but this is a simple version. This Cas9 will then pick up the RNA, the, the uh, guide RNA that's produced by this, by this unit it will incorporate it. You can kind of see it incorporated in this 3D image. Then what it will do is it will, in the bacteria, it will hang out in the cytoplasm, it will attach itself to DNA, um, and it will surveil that DNA. It literally goes along the DNA opening, surveilling the DNA, and if it comes to a match like this guide RNA, it will, you know, it'll surveil it until it comes to that match. It's actually opening the DNA, and I with my PowerPoint, I can't really show that, but the idea is that it's, it's surveilling that DNA. If it comes to it, it goes, it stops, and now the nuclease portion comes in and cuts the DNA. It will cut, sever the DNA at that site. And because that's viral specific DNA, it doesn't cut the bacterial DNA. This is, once that virus has been cut up, now it's no longer viral DNA. It's pieces of viral DNA, and they don't they don't work as a, as a virus. And so this can stop the infection um, for the bacterium. However, we've taken this system in just the last few years now, and we very easily, so to speak, can engineer RNA to be guide RNA, and it's not this, it's whatever we wanna put there. So we can take this system that's intended for, back, you know, evolved as a, as a, as a bacterial immune response, we can take this, we can add our own desired RNA sequence here that matches some DNA sequence that we're wanting to target. And we can go specifically find that DNA sequence in using this system in, the, in a eukaryotic um, genome or a prokaryotic genome, either one, it's very versatile. So that's the basic mechanism by which it works in in prokaryotes, um, we've taken it and done more with it uh, to give us some genetic tools. Before we move on, let's talk about genetic disease because one of the big promises of, of CRISPR is the, is the ability to treat genetic diseases. S genetic diseases come in two sort of basic categories. One category is that a protein is missing or it's dysfunctional, just doesn't work. So either the, the whole gene is gone, which is a possibility, or the sequence is so garbled that the protein that produced does not function as, as, in, as intended, if you will. Um, examples of, well, blonde hair versus uh, uh, black hair. Black hair, the gene for that dark melanin is present. Blonde hair is actually the absence of, of that protein being able to be pr produced. Now, we don't generally think of that as a disease, but um, you can have hair color disease issues, like if you're looking at wild populations of organisms, hair color can be critically important to its survival. But um, mo probably most genetic diseases are in this category. They tend to be recessive traits. Then there are a few conditions where the protein that is produced is harmful. It's not that it's missing or it just doesn't do its job. It's actually harmful and does bad things to the 
to the person or the animal or the organism that has this. So those are the two things to keep in mind. Either it's missing or dysfunctional or it's harmful. So what can CRISPR do? Well, we're gonna start with sort of the simpler version and that is simply cutting DNA. We can program this CRISPR-Cas9 system to go after and target basically any, um, any sequence of, of, of DNA and cut it. So when we cut DNA, here are some of the tools that, that, that just cutting it can potentially be developed into. So we can destroy potentially viral segments inserted into our own DNA. Um, think about HIV and the herpes viruses, herpes sim simplex uh, one and, and two, as well as chicken pox. Chicken pox is not a pox virus, it's a, it's a herpes virus. And HIV is a retrovirus. All three, all, both of these are all four of those, however you want to look at it, as do other um, viruses. What they do is they, they will lysogenize. That means they insert a copy of themselves into the host DNA. So if we're talking about humans, it will insert it into um, the cell's DNA. Um, Epstein-Barr, some other things like that. A lot of the diseases that the viruses that cause cancer, for example, do this and, and they'll insert into the DNA, which can mess up your DNA and lead to cancer. That's why they're, they're carcinogenic in, in many cases. The, the advantage of this is we might be able to deliver these to cells. They can surveil your DNA. And if they come across, for example, an HIV sequence, they could cut that HIV sequence, disrupting the HIV virus in the cell, because once it goes into the DNA of the cell, your immune response basically cannot, can't find it, can't, can't hit it. It's really hard for your immune system to deal with these, which is why herpes, chicken pox, HIV, and some of these others, you have them lifelong because your immune response can't target them. However, we might be able, very likely we'll be able to program uh, the CAS system to go in and cut, identify those and cut those thereby potentially curing some of these diseases that we thought were uncurable. Another advantage that CRISPR is going to be involved with and just cutting DNA, we might be able to program it to go cut actually bacterial DNA. So it's actually using bacterial mechanisms against bacteria. The bacteria use it against viruses, but we might be able to modify it to use it against bacterial DNA. So, you know, most people know we're starting to have trouble with a lot of, of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Well, this would be another, might be another, most likely will be another tool in the arsenal where we can create these um, CRISPR-Cas9s to go after specific bacteria. They cut the bacterial DNA, rendering the bacteria, um, you know, the, if the bacterial DNA disintegrates, well, then that's, that's it for the bacteria. Um, from a research uh, standpoint, they can be very helpful. Uh, just simply cutting a gene, you might be able to knock it out. And so we can use uh, laboratory organisms, knock out specific genes and see what the effect is. Uh, we already do that, but we do it in a much more difficult, harder, slower process. And this would be able to very specifically target it. Wouldn't be accidental. We'd be able to say, we're going to go knock out this gene. And then next week, we'll knock out another gene. And the week after, we'll knock out another gene of our choosing and be able to see how that, how that that knocking out that gene will, will uh, function. Uh, going back to disease um, issues, we might be able to knock out harmful genes. Again, genes that are producing proteins that are bad for us, we will be able to knock those out. This is a little bit imprecise in some ways because when you simply cut the DNA, it turns out that your cells, my cells, animal cells, plant cells, really don't like their DNA being cut, right? It's, it's not a good thing for a cell to have its DNA cut. So it goes in and it tries to repair that, that DNA. It has, it has mechanisms to repair cut DNA. When it does it, often it doesn't get it. It can repair it or it can put things in sometimes that it's a little less precise. It, it, it just cuts it and then the repair process may or may not work and may or may not be consistent. And so that's, that's one of the things that, uh, that cutting kind of has to deal with. Now, let's move to the next level of CRISPR, and that is to cut and then insert a piece of desired DNA. It turns out that we can actually put DNA, a gene or genes, 
in this system. And not only will it cut, but it will now insert a copy of that gene. And then the repair process, it actually directs the repair process to make the, the complementary strand and it, and it fixes it based on the piece of DNA we, we put in there. And this has an amazing kind of, of uh, potential. And you'll see, and this is where the picture came from, you know, the, the cutting the DNA and inserting a, a new novel piece of DNA is the idea here. So um, what can we do with this? These, where we cut and insert desired DNA. Well, let's start at a little bit lower level. We can remove and insert a, and or insert a single nucleotide at a specific site. So we can take one nucleotide like, uh, like a T and replace it with an A. Get rid of the T, replace it with an A. This is the case with sickle cell anemia. Um, well, let me mention a lot, a lot, a plethora of genetic diseases are single cell, uh, single nucleotide replacements. In other words, there's one nucleotide that got put where another one should have been, and it messes up the it messes up the the protein involved. Sickle cell anemia is an example of this. There's lots of them. Sickle cell anemia is an example of this. And in sickle cell, a, an adenine has been replaced by a thymine, which turns what was supposed to be a glutamic acid into a valine. Now, this is one, one nucleotide out of the entire sequence. Um, hemoglobin is a 574 amino acid large molecule. So think about that. One of those, 573 are correct, one is wrong. But that one makes it sickle, makes it uh, uh, prob seriously problematic. And if you are homozygous for both, uh, in, in both of those, it is a devastating disease. Even with modern medical technologies, it's pretty, pretty tough. So what if we can take that and go in and replace that one letter, that one nucleotide, and um, it's actually already been done. There, there was a lady who was treated this way. Um, as an experiment, um, they basically took out her blood bone marrow, modified that bone marrow with a with this mechanism, uh, fixed her her bone marrow cells. Then they had to kill her bone her her existing bone marrow cells in her body through through um, chemo, and then reinsert because you can't have a bunch of if you're going to do this, you can't have a bunch of of improper red blood cell uh, blood cell manufacturing um, cells. And after a couple of years, she's still doing okay. So she's actually improved and is not having to make all these trips to the hospital, et cetera. Another devastating disease is progeria. Uh, this is the disease that, for example, um, will cause children to age at a, an excessive rate. The average lifespan of children who have progeria is 14 years. They die of old age at 14 years old. It's just, it's just horrendous. Um, this is another single nitrogenous based replacement in the LMNA gene. It's a dominant condition if it's there. Um, their parents don't pass it to them. There's actually a, a coding error uh, that occurs. So it's, it's uh, well, a parent may pass it, but the parent doesn't have it in the, really in their genome. It's a, it's a unique thing that's happened. But that one, that one modification renders these, these poor children in a, in, a, in a devastating situation. We might be able, probably we'll be able to use uh, this technology to go in, um, repair that one, that one nucleotide and, and totally alter the course of their life. Um, a lot of genes, uh, a lot of diseases, and the, the gene is missing or it's bad. Cystic fibrosis is an example. And so it may have lots of error. So, so replacing one nucleotide won't fix it. Well, in this case, what we can do is we can send in CRISPR to potentially cut it and insert the, you know, cut out the bad stuff, insert a good gene that does the job. Cystic fibrosis is one of those examples. With cystic fibrosis, um, people who suffer from that, they have a protein in their, in, their, in their airways that's supposed to be pumping ions, in particular chlorine ions, and it doesn't pump properly. And so there's a buildup of ions that leads to mucus uh, buildup and all the other associated issues with cystic fibrosis. What if we go in, we, we actually insert the proper gene in those cells, now they will be able to produce that protein and, and that would eliminate that disease. Um, another example is we can cut and add segments of DNA like stop codons, um, which would be a stop triplet in the DNA, but basically add a stop codon at the right place so that we either can turn off a bad gene 
that's producing bad things. We just stop it early so that it's not producing it. Or uh, we might be able to insert a stop code on in a correct position so that it doesn't make the bad protein. Uh, Huntington's disease is an example of this. Huntington's is a, is a situation where the Huntington gene has too many CAG repeats at the end. So it has CAG, 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 and it makes this very big globby protein that collects on neurons, leads to neural death in early age. I mean, as early as 25 to 45, 50 years old, um, people are dying of, of like um, Alzheimer-like like symptoms. It's not Alzheimer's, but it, you know, it's similar in a way. Well, the reason it occurs is because all of those extra repeats cause, cause the problem. Well, we can go in, put a stop code on, like early on at the early part of those CAG repeats, now they don't make this big globby protein. In fact, they're making a good protein. They turn a bad, that would turn a bad protein into a good protein. So it has some real promise there. Um, here are a few other things that we're going to be able to do with CRISPR. It turns out that we can modify and not cut DNA with CRISPR, but we can find genes put that CRISPR at the promoter region of the gene and attach some transcription factors to the CRISPR that will promote gene activation. So we can turn on genes. We aren't really actually doing any gene editing there, but we are modifying the gene uh, expression. So we turn up the gene um, and that will promote transcription. We can do the opposite. We can add inhibition factors and it goes up to the promoter and it retards, it turns down or even turns off the gene uh, reducing transmission. So, I mean, uh, transcription. So we can do both things. This would be, in the first case, it would be if a person has a gene, but they're not producing enough of a protein to give them a disease state. The second would be they have the gene that produces way too much stuff, we need to turn it down. Um, from a research standpoint, we can attach fluorescing proteins to the DNA. Uh, this is actually already commonly used, but this would be very specific, very quickly add these, these, uh, these fluorescing pr proteins so that we can, we can analyze um, DNA architecture, genes, et cetera, uh, locations, things like that. Uh, we could paint chromosomes so that you could watch individual chromosomes behavior uh, during the, the cell cycle and this life of the cell, finding out a lot more things. And then again, another way to knock out genes in lab organisms so we can see what the effect is. It just simply helps us to identify the gene and protein function. Um, I'll mention it here at the bottom and I will mention it again here shortly. Uh, GMOs, genetically modified organisms are, you're gonna see a lot of them, like it or not, there's going to be a bunch of them because CRISPR is a tool to, to like you haven't, like we've never seen. But then the last thing, what can you do with CRISPR? This is, this is the one that just blows my mind. Sorry, I bumped the computer there. Um, and that is CRISPR, CRISPR can be turned into a gene drive. Now, what that means is a gene drive, a gene drive is where we amplify a gene in a population. And it is especially quickly done in, in quickly reproducing organisms. So insects, for example, that reproduce, you know, may have multiple generations in a, in a single season. Um, when we have this, it can, it can be pushed through a, an entire population. A particular gene can be pushed through an entire population in a very short period of time. It does not follow Mendelian principles. Um, so here's the pieces that you have to have for it. You have to have the gene or genes that you want to insert, the coding for the guide RNA, and then the appropriate cast genes on top of the genes, the desired genes. So what you're actually doing is you're inserting a gene or genes and the hardware to make it happen. And, and so now that, that organism will start producing the cast proteins, which will allow the editing to, to occur in subsequent generations. And this is, it's amazing. And that's if it gets in the germline. So what we would do is we would insert this into embryos, for example, of the, of the target species that we're wanting to, to deal with, and then that would become part of the genome. It would be introduced in subsequent um, critters. So um, a, a couple, three years ago, there was an amazing um, research conducted by Anthony James, uh, Ethan Beer, and Valentino Gantz. Um, 
basic, so Anthony James had been working on genetics to produce a mosquito, an Anopheles mosquito, which transmits malaria, that would render the mosquito, it wouldn't kill the mosquito, but it would make it so that it doesn't harbor malaria. Even if it sucked up malaria uh, uh, gametocytes from, a, from an infected person, they would not replicate, um, reproduce, and turn into the infective form um, that, that does currently happen in Anopheles. So he found the gene to do that. He also tied it along with a gene that would make them have red eyes. That's an advantage. You'll notice I made these two with amazingly big red eyes. That was just to be able to see, see it in the, hopefully in the, in the presentation. So these two have not only the red eye gene, but they also have the anti-malarial gene. They will not transmit, sorry, they will not transmit malaria. And it had this CRISPR-Cas9 gene drive as part, that was part of the whole system. They put it into a breeding box with 30 other mosquitoes. Now, we have to assume that the red eyes and, and the anti-malarial gene did not confer any real reproductive success or, or selective pressures against it. Let's say it's just neutral. If it was, if it was completely neutral, what would we expect? Well. When it was inserted, it was thought that it was actually these red-eyed individuals had one of the, it's, it's really two genes, right? It's a gene for anti-malarial. Um, it's a gene for the red eyes, plus the cast genes that go along with it. It had one, so it was a heterozygote. Well, if it would mate with a homozygote, white-eyed, natural um, wild type, we would expect that half of its offspring would have the red eyes and the, and the mutation, and half of the offspring would have the normal, natural, white eye component. But here's what happened. When they opened up the box after two generations, 3,800 mosquitoes were produced. This is the grand offspring generation, only two generations. What they found was every single one of the mosquitoes had, had the red eyes, therefore the malarial, had the, had the genetic mutation. How did that happen? Because we would expect this, right? Well, this clearly hadn't happened. Instead, here is what happened. When they inserted it with the gene drive into this critter, not only did it get the, on the one chromosome, it got the, the gene mutation, but because it had the machinery for the gene drive, it inserted it on the other chromosome as well. So now this is not a heterozygote, it's a homozygote with the gene drive. When it mates with, uh, another mosquito, all of the offspring are heterozygotes. So, so these offspring are going to be all red-eyed uh, mutants. But wait, what happens to these? Because this has a gene drive, they're not RW, they're RR because it inserts it over here. So now what's happened is all of the offspring are homozygotes with the gene drive. So when they, they mate with a second, it just powers through a population. What we would expect, if I go back, let me go back here, sorry. If we saw this, we would expect about 6%, if this was a normal Mendelian distribution and this was the actual genotype, we would expect about 6% of the grand offspring to have the mutation. In the gene drive, 100% have the mutation. It's, a, it's an amazing capability. So this has the possibility of, for example, ending malaria. If we can release these, there are ethical questions. That's why it's not been done yet. There's ethical questions. We'll talk about those in the wrap up here. Um, but this gene drive is just, just amazing. Uh, another place this could be used, um, exotic organisms that have gotten where they don't belong, zebra mussels, Asian, Asian carp, Asiatic carp, for example. You could put something in that would cause them not to succeed. Uh, would have would have selective pressures against them, but because it's a gene drive, it would go through the population. But there's problems. Mosquitoes, insects, fish, and clams don't stay where they were put, where you put them. Uh, plants don't stay where you plant them, right? They go elsewhere. And so this can can work through natural populations. If we if we look at mosquitoes, if one country decides to do it, well, that means Africa is doing it because it, you know, if one country in Africa does it, all of Africa is doing it because these will ultimately spread throughout Africa. Um, Asian carp. What if we don't want them in North America? But what if one of those, what if one of those Asian carp that are modified 
get back into the Asian in ecosystem, now they would pass that gene to the natural Asian carp population. So it, it has its problems. We'll, we'll wrap up with that in a minute on, on, on those problems. So let's talk about genetic engineering because this is what this is. There's the hard way. And by the way, I have to give credit to my colleague, Brady Godwin, who today and he and I were talking about this. And so I've pirated this from him. Um, I thought it, he, he expressed it better. So I'll just use his language, largely speaking. He was, he's talking about genetic engineering. There's the hard way to do it. And I don't have the best picture for it, but the hard way is the old fashioned way. The way we've done it, the way you're eating almost all the products that you eat in the grocery store today have been engineered through good old fashioned breeding programs. You know, farmers, they, they pick that sheep, which had a characteristic to mate with that sheep and they selected for a trait and they got better wool and they got bigger sheep and better beef and, and better wheat and, and better tomatoes and better avocados and all kinds of everything that you eat at the store. I guarantee there's nothing at the store short of maybe wild caught fish that, that haven't been genetically engineered the hard way. And that is through good old fashioned animal husbandry and plant breeding mechanisms. Uh, one can even argue if you say, well, I, you know, I, I hunt deer or elk or antelope, so I eat naturally. You know what? Our, our selective pressure against those, those and our hunting has had an effect on those, on those genes in those populations as well. They're even engineered by human interventions. So everything you eat has been done the hard way, but it's been done through just normal genetic mutations and selecting the ones that were good and not reproducing the ones that were bad. Then in the last couple decades or so, we've had an easier way, but it's been pretty expensive. And so it includes some of the techniques that did some great things like uh, allowed us to put genes for human insulin, human insulin and factor eight blood clotting factor into bacteria. So we could grow that and make a, make a cheaper, safer version of those, of those, of those drugs. But the problem was that was expensive. And so when you see GMOs as an example today, Almost all of them have been produced in this old but expensive way. Um, it's a lot faster, a lot faster than waiting for, for mutations to show up, but not as specific, tends to be expensive. So it can cost hundreds of thousands or in some cases millions of dollars to, to get that end, that end product. But it's been worth it in many cases because the, the growth rate was so much better or the shelf life was so much better, whatever the case might be. And now we're looking at, a really easy and a cheap way, and that's that's CRISPR. And so the, we're going to be seeing CRISPR really, really becoming more and more uh, utilized in for all kinds of things. All right, so let's take a look at the good. What's good about CRISPR? Lots really good. One, it's simple to use. It's cheap. Um, those two things make it. It's. It's. I mean, you can't be. Uh, you you have to have some some thought about it, but it's not a terribly hard technology to understand and get to, and it's relatively cheap. So instead of calling, costing hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars, we're talking about thousands of dollars, and in some cases, maybe hundreds of dollars. Um, pretty much any lab, the lab that, that Dr. Newbold and I work in would be able to do this. So even simple college and some high school labs would be able to, to pull this off. So it's not the uh, it's, it's not that hard. Um, so that makes it very usable. Um, it has high likelihood to cure many genetic and microbial diseases. That's a great thing. Um, will facilitate genetic, evolutionary research, ecological research, and all kinds of research that we haven't even thought of right now. I mean, it's going to be a tool, uh, an amazing tool for that. We may be able to remove diseases in natural populations, much like the example with the, with the mosquitoes. Or we might be able to remove mosquitoes entirely. That's an ethical conversation we'll have to have. Um, help us develop new drugs, uh, making new products, new novel products. For example, there's a, a plastic, you know, a, a synthesized plastic from uh, some of this. It's biodegradable plastic. It acts like plastic, but will ultimately degrade. And this has uh, been done already with CRISPR technology. <coughs> Pardon me. And we'll be able to much more rapidly improve our, our crops and our cultivars. Cultivars are the things that humans have cultivated like dogs and cattle and sheep and corn and, and almonds and all kinds of stuff. Everything, again, everything uh, that we eat and grow and farm and have in our houses as pets, these are all cultivars. 
um, just look at some of the crazy breeds of dogs that are out there, right? These are, these are cultivars that we have modified. We're going to see more of that. All right, so there's the good. But what about the bad and the ugly? There, there are some problems. So here, let me just go through some of those issues real quickly that can be problematic. Some, gui some guide RNAs work better than others, and some don't work so well. Um, this is going to be primarily, are you truly getting a unique piece of DNA? So, so you may find, hey, here's a gene. Here's I'm going to make a guide RNA for that gene or to cut in at that location, but you didn't realize it. And there's multiple other cut, cut sites in the genome. And so uh, it may cut or insert at wrong locations and that could cause off-target effects that uh, could, be, could be serious. Um, real quickly, I wanna talk to mature organisms versus embryos, especially when it comes to humans. Now we're doing a lot of embryonic work uh, or a lot is being done on organisms, insects and lab, lab organisms and plants. Uh, so far, not on humans, with an exception. They're, they're, um, in China, there was a scientist who has inserted HIV using CRISPR into three embryos. Um, my understanding is he was convicted and sentenced to three years of prison. Uh, and so most scientists, uh, most scientists and ethicists are in agreement right now. Embryos, human embryos should be totally off limits until we get this thing figured out. Um, you could have harm to the supply, the food supply. I mean, for one, you could have a super gene get out that goes through and wipes out a, uh, your, your crops. Um, and we also have then, you know, potentially additional loss to genetic diversity. And that is a real concern for our crops. If the less diversity you have, the more susceptible they are to, to disease and other issues. I'll point out ethics, ethics, ethics. This is full of ethical considerations. Here are just a few. Um, uh, all those before were ethical considerations. Um, you could have tyrannical governments that are forcing gene editing on their subjects and, 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 and using it inappropriately. How about designer babies? How much is too much? Most of us would agree that fixing cystic fibrosis in a, in a child is probably a good thing. And well, you could catch that early on and, and, that, and really like in the embryo early on, um, and you could really effectively cure that. But then, you know, maybe we'd like a little bit more muscle in that, in that child or, you know, a little more in parent intelligence or let's make them a little taller. I like basketball. So, so I want my kid to be a little taller. And while you're at it, let's change the eye color and the, ear, and the hair color. And you know what, let's pick the gender. And, and in fact, we could get to a point where, you know, let's, oh, look at this cool skin pattern. Let's, let's put blue scales on their, on their skin as a pattern. Um, you know, sort of the, Pan Am scenario where it gets a little crazy. So at some point, most people agree, we cross a line and where is that line and, and how are we going to control that? Uh, some groups don't wanna be cured. Um, within the deaf community, for example, there's a very strong contingent um, because they have, because those who are deaf speak a sign language, there's a culture, there's a, you know, there, there are many within that group that would find it offensive to consider it, you know, something that needs to be cured. So, so that needs to be part of the discussion. Ecological effects, serious ecological effects. Animals, um, plants don't stay where you put them. So if you put something in with, with these genes, they are liable to stray. They're liable to cross into other populations when, when reproductions occur. Um, you might release super critters into an environment that that decimates the environment or species within the environment. And then you can have species extinction, both unintentional and intentional. And those are serious conversations to have. Uh, last thing on the bad and the ugly, did I mention it's cheap and easy? That means that it's a low barrier to entry. So a lot of people, maybe some who want to cause problems can, can get into it. You know, look at, look at um, computer viruses. A lot of people making computer viruses just for the just to be, just to be an honorary and cause, cause mayhem. So with that said, we do need to have a very serious global discussion. Like any technology, there's good and bad. I'll point out automobiles. You know, automobiles in the United States alone kill 36,000 people a year last year, um, maim and injure about 1.35 million people. So that's some serious consequence to the automobile technology. Yet you don't hear many people saying we need to ban automobiles because automobiles give us so much in return for that, for that carnage that they do cause. Nuclear energy, another example um, that, you know, 
it, it's a great source of energy, but it can also be turned into pretty devastating weapons. And and probably the worst thing we can have is is every country in the world having nuclear uh, nuclear weapons. So the technology has good and bad. Um, regulations cannot keep up with the pace of this currently. There is a call by a lot of scientists doing this and a lot of people in the ethicists saying, we've got to stop this, slow this down a little, maybe not stop it, but we need time to catch up um, and figure out what's the right way to do this. Because it, if we're not careful, we'll have a Pandora's box that's opened and, and may not be able to stuff the stuff back in. So with that, um, my, my image here is supposed to evoke the good and the bad, the storm and the and the glory of, of, of the of the deal. And with that, we would be glad to take some questions. Thank you, Matt. Fascinating. I haven't delved too far into CRISPR, but uh, that was a great overview, especially the gene drive piece. That's that's um, yeah, I, I wasn't familiar. Profound. With that, so. Yeah, it's, it's profound. Yeah, for sure. Let's see. So, so question. It's one question in the chat box and one in the Q&A. Okay, so I'll, I'll look at the one in the chat box and then I'll go to the Q&A. Um, uh, the question is, any current efforts to use CRISPR with autoimmune diseases? I'm not aware of any. I would bet there are. Um, I, I would not bet against that. Um, so I'm not particularly um, aware of them, but yes, there could be autoimmune. Clearly, a lot of autoimmune diseases are associated with some kind of a genetic thing. So if we can identify what that genetic component is that's causing the problem, it has the potential of fixing that problem. So um, certainly there will, there will be. Um, that, yes, I just don't know of it occurring at the moment, but I'm, I'm sure in some labs it, it is. So let me go to the question and answer and then I'll come back. It looks like we have a couple more there. Um, Let's see, let me go ahead and read that. As a parent of a recently diagnosed type one diabetic, uh, which I'm sorry and, and, and best wishes on that working out well for you guys. Um, I've been reading uh, a lot about CRISPR tech, techniques allowing us to create new pancreatic islet cells. Uh, for those of you who know, don't know, the islet cells are, they have cells of longer Hans and um, they're, there's the A and B cells. They, they produce insulin and glucagon and of course, with uh, a type one diabetic, that is attacked. Those those insulin producing cells are attacked, so they can't produce insulin. They're not. They're sensitive to insulin. And insulin insulin works great. It just won't. Uh, they can't produce it. Um, they will no longer be affected, destroyed by our immune system. It seems this would be something that is achievable. Um, what would limit this from rapidly being available to affected patients? Um, and thanks for your lecture. Thank you um, for joining us. Ethics will be in, in that conversation. Ethics have to be in that conversation. Um, again, putting it into the, the younger you try to do this, the more complications, the more, um, you know, there's less patient um, knowledge of it. Um, but I certainly expect that we will probably in the not too distant future certainly within the next decade or two. I don't know if it'll come in time for your, your, your child immediately, but um, certainly we're going to be seeing, uh, <laughs> you may see it within the decade, who knows, maybe sooner, where we can go in and actually um, tweak the, you know, do something, whatever it is, if we can figure out why that is being attacked, we can perhaps undo that genetics. Um, could CRISPR work to cure brucellosis and stop the spread? Um, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know the mech. Brucellosis is a uh, cause Bangs disease in, in cattle. Um, absolutely, I'm sure, I'm sure. And the ag industry would have a real interest in that because of the economics of it. So you can bet that there's some agricultural pharmaceutical companies that will be working on, on that um, as well. Let's see, let me see, is there another one here? Are there genes cut from the DNA in the hairpin part of the CRISPR or are they discarded completely? Let's see, so are the genes cut from the DNA in the hairpin part of the CRISPR? Yes, yeah, so from the bacteria, if I'm reading this right, um, when the, I think this is at the bacterial level is what I think your question is asking. So when the, the, the bacteria 
um, when the Cas when the CRISPR Cas9 system goes in there and cuts it, it cuts genes from the DNA of the virus. We see. And the rest is discarded. Yeah, the rest is allowed to disintegrate. So a virus like Lambda DNA, Lambda is a type of virus. I think it has 17,000, I think it's 17,000 base pairs long. That's, that'll give you an idea of the size of, of a viral DNA. It's, it's fairly small. Keep in mind, CRISPR is keeping about 29 of those, uh, of those. So the rest is just disintegrates, breaks down cellular processes, uh, break down, use the nucleotides to build new new RNA and DNA um, components. There's Hope another, one, Go there's ahead. another one in the chat. Let's see, are okay. there any concerns with resistance, e.g. the mosquitoes, if, if this does get released? I'm not aware of concerns with <laughs> resistance. Yeah. Now you, by the way, you could build a CRISPR mechanism to give them resistance. So... Um, it, you know, both sides of that are there. Um, mm -hmm. This one, I would not expect that there'd be any resistance. Um, one question we have to address is, would it be reasonable and ethical to eliminate mosquitoes entirely, for example? And, and here's, here's the problem. You might eliminate mosquitoes and not realize it and crash other parts of the ecosystem, you know, for, for organisms that are dependent on those mosquitoes. And so, you know, there was a discussion about the Ethics, the, the ethics of getting rid of smallpox. We had it at our disposal to destroy all the smallpox in the world. And as I understand it, um, probably USAMRID or maybe it's CDC and um, a Russian governmental lab kept, kept samples. But there was discussion, do we have the right to get rid of a genome, even a horrible genome? Um, myself, I think it's okay to get rid of smallpox because I think it is. Um, but that's a, it's a hard, con it's a conversation that needs to be had. And so anyway, going back to this, um, it would be unlikely, I think, to have, well, in the mosquito example, unlikely to have resistance, but where you could have a problem, what if you build resistance to say pesticides or insect attack or something like that, or some other pretty serious thing in a plant or some organism that's a cultivated organism, and then it gets out. Star, star corn was an example. Um, star corn had genes that were getting out into the wild population. Um, there's the possibility that you could have that with a gene drive, get into the wild population, go through it. And now you wouldn't have any pesticides or herbicides to work against, uh, for example, in the agricultural or, or medical industry. So, so it had, there are ramifications for this. Let me move on to the next one there. Do you know about any legislative conversations around protecting genetic diversity the, and uh, the right to exist, uh, i.e. mosquitoes and their relations to bats, et cetera. See, there's a great point, right? I think the conversations are starting. This is one of those conversations, right? I mean, by becoming aware of what's going on now, people can start having, uh, a, can be participants in that conversation. And it needs to be a large conversation. I think you will see a lot of scientists, even genetic engineers saying, hey, well, we're going to do it until we, but we need to have conversations about it. And so these are starting. You'll probably start seeing some stuff in the UN. Um, you will probably start seeing more and more uh, discussions about CRISPR. I, I expect in the next year or two, you'll start seeing perhaps some legislatures taking on questions, maybe the U.S. legislature taking on questions about CRISPR. Um, we need to have these conversations. Again, you're participating in this conversation tonight, which is, is part of that process. Um, let's see, let's move on here. Um, we'll go to the next one. What are the symptoms of sickle cell? So sickle cell is, it, it depends if one is a heterozygote, that is they have a normal allele for producing normal hemoglobin, and then they have the sickle allele, which produces the sickling trait. So here's what happens in Sickle, sickle cell. The hemoglobin, that valine that I told you about, which replaces the glutamic acid. Hemoglobin, you know, it's a, it's a, let me see, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see what I'm doing here. And so let me move a panel there. It's a, it's a 3D structure. As it deoxygenates, each hemoglobin will hold four O2s, O2 molecules. As it deoxygenates, what happens is it, cha it changes conformational form. 
And as it does, that valine becomes exposed. That valine is a charged, is a charged amino acid. And it turns out that that charge, as it becomes exposed, now it acts like a little magnet. And if there's other valines, I mean, sorry, other hemoglobin molecules that have opened up, they get attracted to each other. So now you have little magnets, hemoglobin acting like magnets, not such a good thing. Hemoglobin should be able to move around. When it starts hanging up, it, it becomes problematic. The reason that caused sickle cell in a person, especially who only has the sickle cell hemoglobin, is that now you have all magnets. In a person who's, who's heterozygote, they have half of their blood, their hemoglobin molecules are magnets and the other half are not. And it, it, it's, they have symptoms, it's not as serious. But in a person who has full, full blown sickle cell, what will happen is all these little magnets get together. Here would be my example. Let's say I have a, a bag of, let me get this right, <laughs> trying to do this is, is a little awkward. I have a bag of marbles and I have a bag of circular magnets. So here's my bag of marbles. I crush it up. I make it whatever shape I want. I throw it down on the table and it turns just into a, you know, it changes, it goes into a blob on the table because it doesn't hold its shape. But now I have, whichever it was, I have my bag of magnets and I crumple them up. I send them through a capillary and I crumple them up. Now I throw it down on the table. It doesn't unfold. It stays in that shape which is exactly what happens in sickle cell. As the cells go through the, 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 the capillaries, which tend to be a little narrower dynamer, dy, uh, diameter than the, um, the cell itself, it kind of gets crushed and it folds. And if it folds, now it gets into that classic sickle shape. And as it comes out the capillary, if it does come out the capillary, it can't unfold because those magnets are kind of holding it. Or more likely, it's sickled. It lodges in the capillary, plugs up the capillaries, and that's where you have tons of tissue damage. It tends to occur under stressful events. So, so like oxygen stress, um, which can be athletics, but it can be stress of other kinds. They go through a deoxygenation, like low oxygen in the blood. And now all the hemoglobin acts like magnets. When that happens, it can't be undone. You're going to the hospital, you're getting a transfusion, maybe a large transfusion of blood, try to get rid of the of the sickling hemoglobin and put red blood cells, borrow the red blood cells of somebody else that isn't, isn't sickled. It, every time that happens, of course, there's tissue damage. And so, um, and sometimes it can lead to stroke and heart attack and serious things like that. Um, so someone with this has a, has a pretty serious complication. I hope that answers it. Symptoms, I guess that would be the symptoms and maybe the consequences of sickle cell. Let's see. Uh, what is the typical timeline in which change occurs in the body, such as the sickle cell anemia patient? Let me see. What is the typical timeline? So if we're talking about sickle cell anemia, timeline could be minutes. Um, you, I, think, I think this is what you're, you're asking. I apologize if I'm not answering it properly. Um, if someone has the sickle cell trait, homozygous for sickle cell anemia, they can within minutes have a major sickling event if they get really low in oxygen. So um, extreme exercise, especially extreme exercise with extreme stress, things like that. If they can't provide oxygen, uh, uh, holding your breath too long, um, what most of us would just, you know, <laughs> be breathing like crazy afterwards, that can, that can lead to a sickling event. So I think, does that answer the question? And that can happen so. in minutes. Yeah. And maybe the other the other potential uh, interpretation is after the after the change with CRISPR, how long for the body to? If I'm not mistaken, on this particular one that I've, I referenced yeah. earlier, it was immediate. Mm -hmm. um, I think zero more trips. You know, no sickling events, um, and I think that's been going now a couple a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Don't, I haven't read recently. Um, I know for about a year, the first year, um, profoundly improved. And now this process is not an easy process because you got to harvest, you know, it's not just go give you a shot of something and then it fixes you. You've got to go harvest the bone marrow. You've got to go kill the bone marrow. You've got, well, before you do that, you would, you would alter the bone marrow to make sure that it, it, it took. So now you've engineered it. The engineering parts, maybe the easier piece of it. And then you would have to kill all the, the bone marrow in the, 
in the sickle cell patient because you don't want them, you don't want those stem cells making more bad hemoglobin. And then you would re-inoculate, re-administer the, the genetically engineered uh, cells. Um, and I think it was pretty quick. And I, I think it was, I don't think it was long. I think there was probably more recovery from the stem cell treatment, you know, from the mm. killing the stem, the chemo from the, chemo. the mm. stem cells. So I think it was pretty quick because there weren't any other cells there. So once those cells started producing blood, I'm sure she probably had to have some transfusion initially to, to, because she probably didn't have adequate amount of blood being produced initially, but um, pretty, pretty minor compared to the many transfusions that, that she'd had all her life. Mm. Additional questions from, for Matt at this point. Generates a lot of questions for sure, Matt. Interesting, really interesting topic and so new. Um, in terms of the, the historical piece of it, there was a delay from the 80s until recently. Were there pieces of it that were being sorted out or was it really kind of this aha moment that? I, I think it was an aha moment. Uh -huh. I think they didn't know what it did until 2012. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Shep and Jay and, and Davna and their teams identified it. So yeah. it was kind of like, well, this is interesting, but what does it do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was an aha moment. So there, there right now there's, there's patent fights going on. It's going to be a bit of a mess, but when it gets worked out, you'll see a lot of stuff. And it'll, it'll, you know, money will be at the, at the heart of most of it anyway, but um, you know, and my, that it drives a lot of good things. So, um, but there is a, I, I'm not sure of the details, but I know that there is a uh, patent court battle going on and mm. I think it's pretty nasty because it's worth a lot of money, you know? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, folks, if there are other additional questions, um, you could email either of us um, and we can try to get back to you. But thanks very much for tuning in tonight. And uh, Matt, big thanks to you. Really appreciate you um, sharing that information with us. Really fascinating technology. Well, thank you. Again, thanks for the invite. And uh, it, it really was a, a pleasure doing so. All right. Have a good one. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. We'll see you soon. Good night, good night all.